Hello again, everyone, and welcome to The Philly Factor. I'm your host, Paul Perello. There is a new documentary uh, that is being uh, released uh, throughout the greater Philadelphia area, and it deals with a um, uh, chapter of uh, American history, but in particular, Philadelphia history. Uh, and I'm pleased to welcome back to the program Sean Stewards, who uh, has been with us before to talk about some of his other film projects, and he's here to join us to talk about his latest project, Edison 64. Sean, it's always a pleasure to have you here on the program. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Paul. Um, I said at the beginning that this is a documentary that um, uh, sort of focuses on a, a chapter of American history, that being the Vietnam War. What people may or may not realize is that uh, the Vietnam War, there were thousands of service members who um, signed up, were drafted, went to war, and never returned home. There's a high school in Philadelphia that has the distinction of having um, lost, um, I guess, the greatest amount of um, students turned service members uh, during the war, and that was Edison High School in, in Philadelphia. Your documentary goes I guess behind um, uh, behind the story, and, and I told you right before we went on the air here that I had always heard that Philadelphia had been home to that startling statistic that uh, more um, graduates of Edison High School, as opposed to any other high school in America, were lost in the Vietnam War. And it's one of those things you sort of hear, but you don't really understand or appreciate until you really see your movie, Sean. So let's talk about Edison 64. What prompted you to make this documentary? This is sort of a follow-up to, we started a new company, American Veterans Media, that's going to produce veterans-themed content. So we started out with the Father Judge. Remember the 27 Crusaders project? It was on Fox and public television. And during the course of that project, a lot of people came up to us and said, what about Edison? They had 64 because Father Judge had the most of any Catholic school and Do Doherty was about the same. They were real close and North Catholic. I think between the three of them, they probably lost between 65 and 70. So they were all right around 27, those three schools. But Edison was 64. So they're double plus a couple more, you know, died from the one school, Edison. And it seemed like a real good time to tell the story with everything that's going on. You know, a lot of people think traditionally, oh, Edison, that's a black school or that's a school for people of color. But almost half of the students that died were also white, you know, from Edison at that time. The neighborhood was turning over. There was deindustrialization going on in North Philly. So a lot of families were moving out of North Philadelphia up north or out to the suburbs or some other part of the city. And that kind of left that area socioeconomically deprived. There weren't jobs, there weren't a lot of things. Gangs between, uh, began to pop up all over, crime went on the rise. There was a lot of issues going on in the sick, late 50s through the 60s and primarily because of those jobs leaving. And then uh, it just seemed like a natural progression from one to the other uh, to keep with our Vietnam veterans themed program. One of the things that I learned is that um, these guys, not only the Edison 64, but uh, a lot of 18-year-olds um, upon graduation, especially in the inner city back then, um, were either drafted or enlisted because uh, they saw it as a way to get out of their uh, circumstances. And for many, like you just described in North Philadelphia, it was a way to get out of that that neighborhood which had been turning and turning um, to the not so good side of things. And that's why you know, they saw this as an opportunity uh, for a better life by you know, doing their time uh, and, and hopefully coming back, um, having served their country. Um, but many of them, as we learn, um, did not come back, uh, not only from Edison, but from you know, high schools, not only here in Philadelphia, but across the country. Uh, so this was really, a way out for them, and tragically for many, um, um, a bad way out. Yeah, like you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, it was opportunity. 
that's what was being pitched to them. Okay, you know, the recruiters were very manipulative too. I mean, that's kind of their job to get people enlist, especially during war when it's more difficult to get people to enlist. Most of the students from medicine enlisted. They were trying to get away from gangs. They were promised a better opportunity for their family, skills, education when they got back. You'll be able to provide for your family. It's, you know, a lot of them were coming from families that were broken up. So that was the, you know, the premise of promise or whatever. They could have an opportunity when they came back and there was no opportunities there. You know, with that area, the deindustrialization and what had happened in that milieu in North Philly. So it, it was a way out for all of them. And they were manipulated. Like I said, they were recruiters were like in the hallways dragging kids out saying, hey, you're going to be a man and make your family better. You know, it was it was a really, really bad time in North Philly. Wow. Um, you know, when you, when you decided to take on this project and, and, and I think it's safe to say that the, um, the Vietnam era service members, um, the veterans, uh, those that served and never came home, uh, really never got the, um, the credit that they so rightfully deserved. It was, you know, up until recently, you know, the Vietnam War was sort of like an asterisk at the bottom of a page because a lot of people didn't like to talk about it. A lot of people didn't want to um, uh, talk about it because perhaps for the first time in the history of the country, uh, America had to sort of admit that they lost a war. So here you are going in and revisiting this chapter, this very sad and sore chapter of history um, was there any reluctance on your part, Sean, to um, to dive into this project for fear that people a wouldn't want to talk to you, or people would say, "Why why are you bringing up this 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 sad chapter in American history?" That's the way we initially approached the Father Judge project. We were very apprehensive because you're going to be delving into the worst time epoch of these people's lives the siblings that were still alive some of the even parents who were really elderly i think we had one for father judge and their families their extended families their communities their neighbors this was all a terrible time the worst time in their lives so we did pre-interviews we asked people about it and they said nobody's wanted to talk to us for 50 years from the first time you get a knock on the door informing you that your service member, your family member was killed. About the first week, you're embraced by your family, your friends, your community, your church, you know, with Father Judges, uh, the milieu they were in. And then after that, nobody talked about anything. It was just kind of like, what's the, the big elephant, the pink elephant or the white elephant in the corner? You yeah. didn't talk about that. So after we talked to them, I think it was cathartic. We, we thought it would go one of two ways. Either it would be extremely emotional, dressing, or it would be cathartic. And it ended up mostly all of them being cathartic. So they wanted to talk about it. So there was no apprehension doing this piece. Plus the dynamics different, you know, from the Northeast. These people had already sort of gotten out of West Philly or South Philly, where North Philly, wherever they were at before then. And the Northeast was more or less a suburb. It was pastoral land that had been developed and they put all these communities up here. It was more akin to what the suburbs became in the row house communities later. But so they, there wasn't that apprehension. Down in North Philly, it was worse because of all of the jobs leaving, because of all that, uh, these areas became, um, you know, there was a lot of criminal activity going on. There was lack of jobs. It was it was it was in peril, just living day to day, going to school, going to your job, going wherever you're at after school, all your extracurricular activities. There was gangs everywhere. Every neighborhood had gangs. So there was no apprehension. This is a story I think we needed to tell because I don't like you alluded to earlier. The exposition is I don't think people get the background. Uh, 64 people from one school didn't die arbitrarily in Vietnam. There was a reason so many from one school died and so many enlisted to get out of that milieu. So you have to understand. So we go all the way back. We had to keep cutting. We went so far back. We had to keep cutting it down the beginning, the backstory. 
like we went all the way back to revolutionary times and right. we kept a little bit of that. And it was a whole process of how deindustrialization came to fruition. You know, it didn't start 10 or 20 years before that. It went all the way back, probably 200 years or more. And then we took it all the way up to the period where the jobs left. That's the backstory. And then it, the, the second act, it just becomes something where it's so dramatic, you know, that I, I, it's a story that had to be told. So and then the third act is kind of the veterans, you know, what they got out of it. You know, that the, there was something good and positive that came out of all this sacrifice and human misery. You know, that there was this fraternal bond between these guys. And I think it has improved with the Vietnam veterans, the way that they're perceived. Uh, like you said, when they first came back, everybody had a horror story. You know, everybody was taught getting spit on, getting punched in the face, sucker punched. You know, there was so uh, things done to their homes. There was just so many things going on with the Vietnam veterans. These were 18 year old kids that thought they were doing their patriotic duty. Most of them, like I said, in Philly enlisted. And, you know, you came home to that, but there's been more of a reverence, you know, the last, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 years towards Vietnam veterans. There's been better memorials. There's been better recognition. Lots of groups now acknowledge them and, you know, award them with things. There's perks for being a veteran. And so I, I think they started to try to rectify all that that they had to go through the way that society kind of and it wasn't all society you know it was just certain elements in it that did it so that i think something good came of all of this but one thing that um uh, you know i find remarkable is that regardless of the demographic um involved in uh, the high schoolers turn enlisted uh, going to Vietnam, um, they sort of become part of this fraternity, regardless, black, white, uh, brown, um, you know, you become part of this fraternity because you're all in this together. While here at home, you know, North Philly and, you know, other parts of the city are going to hell in the handbasket because the city is so torn apart by, uh, you know, racial divisiveness. These guys, these Edison 64, along with all the other people from Philadelphia, these service members that go into war, you become part of this extended fraternity. Uh, many of you, uh, many of them, um, you know, are lucky uh, to be alive and, and come home. But in the case of Edison High School, 64 are not so lucky because they don't come home. Uh, they die in service to their country. Yeah, I mean, it's... I hope the story will illustrate that. Like every point that you just hit is covered in the story. You know, that there's a, like people will never be able to fathom what these people gave up. Sure. You know, that went to war. They gave up their youth. They gave up their mental well being. They get a lot. Some of them gave their lives. I said this in another interview, you know, their limbs, these, these kids were, seeing people eviscerated, incinerated, decapitated, blown up, you know, it was just so many different things. What kind of impact does that have on an 18 or a 19 year old? Even the officers, these guys are just right out of college. You know, they're sending all these young lieutenants over there. I mean, especially combat veterans, you know, it's sure. just what your exposure every day. You know, we had Jimmy Carlin's one of our producers. He kind of came to us with the idea of the father judge project because we did an episode about PTSD for public television with him interviewed. And he sold us on the idea of, of the father judge piece, but he hits it on the head all the time. You know, and a, lot, a lot of these guys go through all the therapies with the VA. So it helps them process a lot of what happened and kind of understand it. You know, you have that fight or flight response to everything where you're either angry and contentious and want to fight, or you just go off by yourself to the woods, literally, you know, people just, yeah want to be totally away from people so they help you understand that another thing is the va's gotten a lot better with this kind of like mental health checks and mental health support for a lot of the veterans a lot of the veterans that we talk to are very appreciative of that but like i said it's unfathomable unfathomable unless you're there unless you've sure. experienced no matter what somebody tells you it's hard enough for you or me or somebody who's just listening to a story 
were incredulous. You know, we're like, how did you live with that? You had to. Every single day there was death around you and you were afraid if you were going to die. And a couple of these guys tell those stories in the documentary. You know, we've been referring to them as the Edison 64, but obviously, you know, there are names that are associated with those uh, 64 uh, service members uh, from Edison High School. And it would be it would be an undertaking unto itself to sort of delve into all 64 of these guys. But do you at least name them uh, in the documentary or pay tribute to those 64? Because, you know, we're just referring to, you know, um, Edison 64. Well, those 64 also had names. So do you sort of um, uh, name them or highlight them in the documentary? Yeah, after the first uh, public screening, we hadn't added the roll call at the end, the taps. In the credits, we were still working on it. So s- somebody came up to us afterwards. Vietnam veterans, they call you on everything. You know, they're not shy. <laughs> they right. come, came up to us and said, you know, you should have had taps in there, you know, in the list of the names. I said, yeah, we're, you know, we're going to get there. I mean, we showed a lot of the names on the wall. There's one story that is kind of representative of the whole group, a guy that might get laid it belatedly get the Medal of Honor, uh, Laurel Blevins. We kind of go into his story as a, like a whole storyline because right. he's sort of representative of the whole group. And then there's a couple of families, again, we talked to and then about the knock on the door. We had a lot more of that in the Father Judge piece, but we didn't want to kind of replicate that again. So we had we focused more this time on before Vietnam, what happened there to drive people to Vietnam what happened in Vietnam and that fraternity afterwards. So we do do a taps at the end with all of the names and throughout you're constantly seeing another thing that was interesting about this picture. It's pretty simple to figure it out was there wasn't a lot of archival material like pictures growing up, like with the judge group, you had some home movies, uh, you know, the old uh, amateur cameras, the eight millimeter, what they used to use is now that they they didn't have as many much cameras in North Philly. And we asked for pictures. We got, you know, some, but not nearly as many as we got for Father Judge. The people couldn't, a lot of them couldn't even afford the cameras. So, and a lot of the families kind of uh, debased. They just went to other places, like where, you know, a lot of the Father Judge guys would go up north to the suburbs or over to Jersey or one of the suburbs out west. These guys there, they were kind of easier to track down. It, it was harder with the Edison people. And then the, a lot of the people that were Puerto Rican went back down south to the islands or down to Florida. So they kind of dispersed a lot more. It was harder getting archival material that was illustrative of individuals that were killed over there. Like we had to go through, you know, Terry Williamson and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial site. We had to go through a lot of yearbooks, you know, trying to get the best images we could. There was no images of a lot of these guys. Like we reached out to people that went to school with them, you know, the families that we could get in touch with. There was some, but like with Father Judge, it was just kind of like catalogs of it, you know, with photo albums of things we could pull. We didn't have that luxury with this one. So we had to kind of go in a different direction with the B-roll and the footage of the areas that they were from, we had to kind of create a lot of the B-roll and the archival material that we inserted throughout it or use yearbook photos or photos that somebody posted on one of the Vietnam veterans memorial sites or got photos from Vietnam that from people that they served with. So that, that was an interesting distinction between the two, the archival material, how much was readily available with the father judge piece, which helped immensely and then the new, you know, the new feature, there just wasn't as many personal images from yeah. families or friends that they were with. How, how um, and you may have answered this or brought this up earlier in the interview, but how, um, for those families that had lost sons um, uh, during the war uh, and who may still be alive, um, how, how receptive were they to the project? How agreeable were they to be interviewed uh, because again, sometimes you know they 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 don't want to um, revisit this uh, this episode or this chapter in their lives. It's sort of like pulling that proverbial bandaid off you know the the wound on your you know on your knee. So how receptive were they if you wanted to reach out to them 
and sort of get their input into this project, were they agreeable to let you and you know your camera crews in to sort of interview them? It was more difficult with this project than the Father De Judge project. That kind of like we kind of just assumed because uh, there was such a great reception from the Father Judge community, and it was uh, you know it was just I, it's to oversimplify it. It was just a lot more difficult. There was three or four families that said yes, and then we followed up multiple times, and they just didn't get back to us. And there was a couple, like, it was harder to get the family, like they would say, yeah, initially for an interview or maybe some archival material or get in touch with somebody. And also we were dealing with a lot of COVID restrictions. So, you know, when we set up an interview, dates kept getting changed. People kept yeah. pulling out on different interviews. We were holding on to the last minute with certain interviews for somebody to show up. We had experienced a lot of things on set that never happened before with this project it was it was an eye opener and I, I attribute a lot of that to the covid but there was also more apprehension from a lot of the families about going on camera and talking about it and with the judge there were some big families too so that gave us multiple opportunities for multiple perspectives from families with this i think we actually interviewed like two family members like most of it was guys who were from the neighborhood or served with them so it's a different vantage point than, you know, the actual knock. And we didn't want this to be, like I said before, too much of the knock on the door again. We had a lot of that with Father Judge because we really wanted to hit home how impacting that was and how that changed these lives dramatically for the rest of their lives. With this piece here, we wanted to focus more on the backstory. So it still works. It's just a different kind of pacing and narrative layering with this story and less centered on the core narrative of, on the family. It was harder. It was, it was more difficult to get family members aboard. Um, I know um, uh, we have a few minutes left here, but I know you've been showing this, um, this documentary uh, around the area, down at the Jersey Shore. Um, where might people be able to find um, Edison 64 and be able to see for themselves what we're talking about here? How could they do that, Sean? Well, we, we've been waiting to confirm this Edison screening, which we confirmed today. So January 15th, we're actually going to show it at the new Edison High School. Uh, and then after that, we're going, as soon as that date was confirmed, we could start scheduling our other schedulings. So we're going to do an additional screening probably in February at the Afro-American Museum. And then we're going to start, we'll put it up on our site, AmericanVeteransMedia.org, is that... Uh, we'll put constant updates of where screenings are at, where they can go to us on Facebook, American Veterans Media, and like us and follow us, and then we can send them dates where all the screenings are going to be. We were going to put DVDs out for Christmas, but we didn't want that to impact the first couple of uh, Philadelphia screenings. So we're going to release the DVD probably in February for Black History Month, and you'll be able to get that. You can actually get that through the site already, AmericanVeteransMedia.org. But it'll be public screenings for months. Even like we're already getting requests for Memorial Day, wow. you know, big events around then. And then we're probably going to partner up with AARP and take them out on the road to military documentaries. So there'll be plenty of chances to see it. Sure. One final question before I let you go. What is it that you hope audiences come away with when they um, watch Edison 64? What these people had to endure, what they had to go through, you know, how they had to live, why they went to Vietnam, the sacrifices they made, and the long in term impact of that. I got, we did a lot of rock and roll content that got a lot of attention years ago, the wages of spin and fabulous and all that. Then we did some Irish profile stuff, the Duffy Scott and the parade, and a lot of television programs for Irish TV in Europe nothing's been as impacting as this with us. You know, you, when you do interviews, you're going into the worst moment of a lot of these people's lives. You need to, people in general, need to understand what these people sacrificed, what they endured, you know, what their families had to go through for that entire, it wasn't, it was communities that were ruined. It was uh, families that were ruined. It was people that served with them that were ruined. 
And then it was generational. It gets passed down. Those PTSD, like the alcoholism, the drug use, the depression. You're growing up in a milieu with that. You're going to become part of that. So we just hope that people understand and appreciate the sacrifice that these people made and to understand, hey, Vietnam veterans aren't, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. The first thing you think of is they're drug addicts or they're alcoholics or, you know, they, they're, they're looking for attention. No, 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 no. You know, there are concrete reasons why these guys had these afflictions that they had. It was because they were traumatized. And these people just, a lot of people go, oh, they were ghettos. They were going to end up that way. There was reasons those neighborhoods became the way that they became and impacted several generations after that because of what they had. Deindustrialization is a real big part of this story. I mean, you need to understand what happened. Once those jobs all went away, it just changed the dynamic of those communities you know, forever. So that's what you wanted to come away. Appreciate these veterans. You know, d- Don't judge them and appreciate what they went through and try to understand the how the past some of this is still replicating itself in the present sure. well sean i want to thank you for your time uh we're out of time but again another great job edison 64 is the documentary and uh great job on the on the documentary and i thank you again for your time thanks for being with us okay thank you until the next time ladies and gentlemen thanks so much for being with us here on the philly factor